All right, good afternoon. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I am Melissa Neal with the Game Center, and today we are really excited to bring you a webinar covering uh, risk, need, and responsivity, and uh, information about applying that across behavioral health and criminal justice systems. Next slide, please. Again, I'm uh, Dr. Melissa Neal, a Senior Research Associate at uh, Poly Policy Research Associates, and we uh, run the GAIN Center for Behavioral Health and Justice Transformation. And I have just a few notes for housekeeping. Next slide, please. First of all, uh, a, a disclaimer, the views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And um, just a, one thing I want to point out, I'll jump to the second bullet on this so people can start uh, filling out the poll. We would love to know who all is joining us today. And so on the right side of your screen, you should see two polling questions. We would love to have you join us. Um, we'd like to understand you know, what areas of the country you may be joining us from, as well as uh, you know, the kind of agency organization you work for. Throughout the presentations uh, on the right side of the screen, you will also see a Q&A portal and there you can enter in questions as they come up. And at the end of the presentations, we will be going through the, the questions and having our presenters respond. And just to note, uh, this webinar is being recorded. Next slide, please. Just a brief look at our agenda. Um, we have some opening comments from John Berg at SAMHSA. And then two presentations, Faye Taxman is presenting on the public health approach to risk needs responsivity, and Deborah Pinals, Dr. Deborah Pinals is uh, presenting on uh, taking the next step, um, using a model for integrated recidivism reduction and treatment planning for individuals with co-occurring disorders. As I mentioned before, we will end with um, uh, discussions and uh, some closing remarks. Next slide, please. And now I'm going to turn it over briefly to John Berg at SAMHSA for some opening remarks. Thank you so much. I just want to welcome everybody to today's webinar on risk need responsivity applications across behavioral health and criminal justice. We appreciate you taking time today to participate in today's informative webinar. To address behavioral health, criminal justice, and criminogenic needs of individuals involved in the criminal justice system, it is important to be able to assess and treat identified needs of these individuals. There is an increasing interest in science-based tools to measure the criminogenic risks and behavioral health needs of people involved in the criminal justice system in order to develop more effective interventions and criminal justice controls to reduce reoffending and to improve the behavioral health of the individual. SAMHSA is interested in promoting evidence-based practices yeah. and the use of risk, need, and responsivity tools to help prioritize scarce treatment resources for those individuals with the most acute and serious behavioral health needs and criminal justice involvement. We are excited today to host today's webinar to present the risk need responsivity model and its implementation into systems to provide a comprehensive system of care for criminal justice involved individuals. We are pleased and honored to have very, two very distinguished presenters today, Dr. Faye Taxman and Dr. Deborah Pinellas. I will turn it back to Dr. Neal. Thank you, John. And we are uh, very uh, pleased and excited to present our two presenters today uh, who are really bringing a, a wealth of information to you. And uh, first, you'll hear from Dr. Faye Taxman. She is a university professor in the Criminal Criminology Law and Society Program at George Mason University. And she's been long recognized for her work in, um, in developing seamless systems of care models that link criminal justice with other service delivery systems. Um, she has worked across the correctional system from jails and prisons to community corrections 
and has experience working with both adult and juvenile uh, people in the criminal justice system. Um, and uh, right now she is uh, overseeing active laboratories uh, with the Maryland Department of Public Safety and uh, with the Virginia Department of Corrections. Next slide. We also have Dr. Deborah Pinels, and she's the director of uh, the program in psychiatry, law, and ethics, and a clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of Michigan. And she's also a medical director of behavioral health and forensic programs for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. And as you read her bio, you will see she, ha she brings a wealth of experience in um, uh, both service and uh, leadership roles, um, working in inpatient, outpatient settings, um, and she is board, board certified in psychiatry, forensic psychiatry, and addiction medicine. And so now we will uh, just briefly take a look at our poll to see who all has joined us. I'm not quite seeing those results pop up just yet. So without further ado, okay, here, the, here we go. We're seeing a, a good majority of you calling in from urban locations. However, um, also seeing some people calling in from rural and suburban. And uh, we see a pretty, um, a pretty diverse group joining us today from all sectors of the criminal justice system, community-based service providers, and government. So welcome to you all. I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Faye Taxman. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm pleased to be with you this afternoon and uh, share with you some information about uh, a public health approach to the risk needs responsivity model. Uh, the risk needs responsivity model uh, is primarily considered a criminal justice way of thinking about how to decide to provide care for people involved in the justice system. Um, but recent uh, modifications uh, and thinking and some of the recent evidence has really led us to blending um, public health integrated into the public uh, R and R approach. So I first want to begin by re by re-examining what we know. So we have a pretty rich base of knowledge about what works and what doesn't work to help people reduce their criminal behavior, improve their functioning in society, and addressing addiction and mental health issues. And color-coded here in these three boxes, red, the red box, number one, uh, indicates what we know in terms of interventions that do not work to change behavior, particularly recidivist behavior or um, reentry into the justice system. The uh, yellow box are promising um, interventions that exist, and the reason they're promising is because there are studies um, that show uh, improvement in client behavior, um, and there are studies that show that there isn't any improvement, and usually that has to do with fidelity or how much um, the actual intervention has been implemented. And then in green, um, in box three, if we want to peel back the window there, um, this is the cohort of studies and uh, interventions that we really talk about in terms of trying to really use to change behavior. Um, and, you know, these are well-researched. There's a number of both meta-analysis as well as single studies to support the efficacy of using these interventions to reduce recidivism, and in many cases also to address behavioral health needs of clients. Um, so what's important is, is that we have information about what we should do with people in terms of the types of interventions and how we should work with people. The harder challenge is thinking about who should be given what types of services. So Don Andrews and Jim Bonta back in the 1990s came up with a model called risk needs responsivity. And they essentially wanted to, re, uh, to make sure 
that we understood that who we put into what program should depend upon the seriousness and severity of the problem behavior. And problem behavior here is defined by risk for recidivism, um, as well as the nature and type of needs that a person has, particularly those needs that drive criminal behavior and that those factors should help us decide what types of programs people go into and that the programs themselves need to be responsive to the unique features of individuals placed in them um, in terms of responding to gender, literacy, intellectual cap capability, mental health functioning of the client. And this, you know, this funnel of risk, needs, and responsivity together can help us reduce recidivism. We have since learned through our research over the last two decades how much different types of non-criminogenic factors, which we, we're referring to as destabilizers, mental health factors, um, some family-related issues, food insecurity, how those also affect individuals and they also need to be taken into consideration. And so these more social determinants of health um, we're using in combination with the r, &R model to help us really advance um, our thinking about who to place and what types of programs to get the best types of outcomes. So let me dive a little bit deeper into the r, &R principles. The r, &R principles basically tell us who, what, where, and, wh and how. The who is who we should place in programs, and the general thinking here is that we target higher risk individuals to more intensive services and controls. Controls here mean drug testing, they mean geographical limitations, they mean structured programming. The NEED principle basically suggests that we need to match the programming that a, a particular uh, provider offers with the needs of a particular client and focus attention on what are called criminogenic needs. And we'll go through those in a bit. And the reason we want to match is because we want to put people into programs that will directly address those criminogenic needs and that way we will be able to really help deal with the factors that drive some of the behaviors of the individuals. Um, we also want to make sure that we attend to the social and psychological factors that may affect a person's ability to function well in that program, um, such as housing, such as food, and other things of that nature. And then, as I indicated before, um, specific responsivity is basically to make sure that the programs are sensitive to gender, ethnicity, age, culture, motivation, uh, literacy, other factors that affect how well people respond to different types of treatment programs or environments that they're in. So the R&R principles are basically designed to help programs think about who should be in what types of services, what types of programs people need in order to address the recidivism, and then how to tailor that to a particular individual. Okay, so let me dive a little bit more deep into this because the terminology in our field oftentimes is a little murky, um, to be honest, um, inconsistent, another way one might want to think about it. So the first item is risk. What does risk mean? Now, the concept of risk is used a lot in our society. There's risk for, you know, recidivism. There's risk for uh, relapse. In this particular instance, what we're really looking at is the risk that a person will engage in further criminal behavior. And this is really, you know, fits into the model the past predicts the future. So essentially, risk here refers to static factors that impact a person's likelihood of reoffending. Um, and one thing we know about these status factors is we can't change them. They can only increase, right? We're not going to change the first time a per how old someone was the first time they were arrested or the number of times that um, they've been on probation. We can only increase those. Um, 
So the issue here of a static risk is to basically use this as a way of looking at to what degree has the criminal justice system had an impact on that person's life. This is often referred to as a standard risk tool. Um, sometimes in the different tools that are out there, this is combined with other measures, and sometimes this is pulled apart. One thing I really want to point out, though, is this definition, and the definition that's used in, a, in the criminal justice system as part of the R&R framework, does not refer to dangerousness or violence. It's really about the number of bites at an apple that a person has had in terms of their interactions with the criminal justice system. It is not about how violent a person is, how serious their offense history is, what types of behaviors they've engaged in at all. Um, and this is actually one of the major criticisms of this particular you know, construct that people use. And it's an area in which there's further work currently being done. Um, but what's important for us to understand is risk can tell us that people have a history of criminal justice involvement. And we can use this as a way of thinking about how much structure does a person need and how much guidance do they need, particularly if they've had periods of incarceration, um, to really learn how to reintegrate into the community. The next um, item I want to talk about is often referred to as risk two, but it's referred to as dynamic risk. Some people call it criminogenic needs. Um, others are moving away from the concept of criminogenic. Um, to be honest, that was a term that um, uh, Andrew Zambanta created. Um, and, and, and the notion is that these are driving risk factors that are related to criminal behavior. But these factors are dynamic, meaning that they can be changed. There are things that we can do through treatment programming, structure, peer support, that can actually help someone address those driving factors and mitigate different types of behaviors. Um, so the goal of identifying the needs of an individual is to really think about how we can reduce these needs so that we can help the person become more stable in the community and reduce their involvement in the, in the criminal justice system. So uh, there are many different ways that these various needs are measured in different instruments. I would highly recommend um, that you take a look at different instruments that your organization might be using. Um, I also highly recommend that you begin to really think about what your program offers to address some of these needs. Um, theoretically, the um, Andrews and Bonta had uh, triaged that there were some needs that were more prevalent in terms of related to criminal behavior than others, though so recent research has suggested that that's not the case and that substance dependence actually is one of the greater drivers of dynamic needs that need attention. Um, and, and we all know that from our populations that we serve. So I do want to pay us uh, to pay attention to that we're what we also know from a need perspective that a lot of our population have a lot of co-occurring disorders and they have a lot of physical health disorders. Um, and the criminal justice population actually has a higher rate of substance use disorders, mental health disorders. Um, STIs and infectious diseases like tuberculosis than the general population. Um, and while oftentimes programs do not think that these are part of what they need to actually provide services for, it is important to note that if we want good outcomes, treating the person as a whole, and this is what Deborah is going to talk about, is really important to get better outcomes. Because if people aren't feeling well physically, it's really hard to function and think in programs. Um, so we need to pay attention. Um, the, the other part I wanted to really focus our attention on is this issue about substance use disorders. 
Um, you know, uh, the DSM-5 has given us different ways of thinking about the severity of substance use disorders, and it is critically important for us to really begin to really think through who has a more serious substance use disorder, who is, um, would benefit from pharmacological interventions, um, particularly for opioids and alcohol abuse. Um, and who has more risky behavior. Um, and, and the reason I bring this up is because oftentimes we think of any drug use as being the same, but in fact, you know, um, the types of drugs people take and their use patterns vary considerably, and we need to be treating those as specific to individuals. Another area that, has, um, that is particularly unique to the people involved in the justice system is criminal thinking, the construct of criminal thinking. Um, and this is a widely used term, criminal thinking. Um, I could also say it's a widely misused term. Um, and, you know, so what we've been doing lately is really trying to help uh, distinguish between thinking errors and schemas or belief systems um, so that we can actually begin to think through, like, what does this really mean, particularly if we're going to intervene with individuals. Um, so I thought it might be useful to kind of share with you a study that we did a couple years ago. Um, we call it the McDonald's study. We took a criminal thinking instrument that's common and um, that's used in a lot of programs, and we basically went to a, several McDonald's for a series of Saturdays um, and asked people to complete this instrument. Uh, we took off the label that was called criminal thinking scales um, and just asked people to, you know, tell us their thoughts about certain items on this instrument. Um, and we essentially then looked at the question of, you know, how do people who are involved in the justice system score compared to people in the general population? And I should tell you that, you know, of the 365 surveys that we collected, um, about 25% of the uh, individuals indicated that they had an arrest history or had been in probation or incarcerated. Um, but we generally wanted to see in which of the distinguishing factors was there was a difference between the general population and the justice involved population. And essentially, we found that only on one construct, personal irresponsibility, um, did the folks who were involved in the justice system score higher than the general population. So some of the other ideas that we think differentiate some of the thinking errors, entitlement, justification, power orientation, cold-heartedness, rationalization, we might want to think about those as different defense mechanisms um, and really help us rethink to some degree how we might want to intervene with people. Um, and so we're suggesting that we really begin to think about different types of interventions to really work with different types of populations. For example, we know that the uh, 18 to 27 year old population is, you know, young adults, they are still in a developmental phase. Um, we know from the neuroscience that their brain has not fully developed. And maybe some of the um, aspects that we think are criminal thinking or risk-taking behaviors are really just part of this in, um, developmental issue. And so, you know, thinking about how we can actually bridge and help young people make better decisions to reduce the risk for involvement in the justice system is something that might be very useful. Um, and I could go through criminal lifestyles, criminal thinking, and some of the schema issues. Um, but given time today, I'm not going to be able to do that. Um, but if you're interested in any information on any of these, I'm more than happy um, to share some curriculums or some material that we've developed. Um, I also wanted to indicate that in the R&R model, we often don't spend enough time talking about people's strengths. Um, so we do know um, that, you know, the best way to work with people is to focus on their strengths and to help people see their likelihood of success. Um, and so helping people look at 
where they have strengths that they can build on during this period of time when they're involved in the justice system can be very beneficial. Um, so we suggest that we think through what are really the stabilizers in people's lives and use that as linchpins to really keep people grounded. Similarly, we need to be aware of those destabilizers. As I indicated before, some of these are, you know, um, determinants of health. Others are just factor, social factors that affect people's functioning in society. Um, but these are things that make it difficult for people to actually do well um, in programming. And being aware of these stabilizers can actually help you administer your programs, but also think about how you can help support someone through the process of reintegration or um, as part of their treatment initiatives. Um, I would be remiss if I also didn't recognize that in any effort in which we're working with people, we should be thinking about the triggers, the people, places, and things, um, because of course these are always useful to help people learn about what those triggers are, because those triggers are the cues that actually affect whether or not the, what types of decisions that people make or the vulnerability that they have. Um, so collectively, the responsivity factor basically suggests that we need to consider the risks, the needs, stabilizers, destabilizers. We need to consider triggers. And we need to really focus our attention on assigning people to the appropriate treatment programs and interventions that are going to support that person, um, both in dealing with their behavioral health disorders, but also in grounding them um, so that they have more support in the community. We know that there are certain types of programming that works better and some types of programming that does not. Um, um, the other big piece about the responsivity principle is that for people with more serious problem disorders, so severity issues, that dosage should be longer than people with less serious issues. Um, so this is really important because a lot of times, a lot of our programs are not necessarily geared towards a dosage level. Um, but in fact, you know, increasingly the research is showing that there are certain dosage amounts that we should be targeting. And I'm speaking dosage here mostly on the clinical um, aspects. Um, and the focus of, you know, dosage is in terms of the amount of therapy and clinical supports for a particular person. Okay, so I've given you a big picture of the r and &R. Now I want to talk about um, some practicality. So one practicality is, is that you need a really good risk and needs assessment tool that you can use to help identify what the needs of individuals are. You need a good case plan, and you need to really think about how you're going to target a person to appropriate programs and services. And I'm going to share with you the risk needs tool that um, we have developed and that SAMHSA um, encourages people to use um, to help with some of those difficult decisions. Um, so, uh, so now I'm gonna turn our attention to this larger issue about assigning people to appropriate programs. So first, um, to be honest, uh, a lot of times in the justice systems, people are placed in programs based upon availability not necessarily based upon need. Um, so a former postdoc of mine, who's now a professor at the University of uh, Central Florida, Mike Cotty, did some analysis in, um, in uh, Kansas uh, looking at placement in different types of treatment programs in their prison system. And it, he basically found that people who participated in a therapeutic community program 27% of those actually had a need for that program, which meant that about 74% did not. Um, and the people who had a need actually, you know, had a lower recidivism rate, and they were using reconviction, 26%. 
compared to those who had no need, 55%. Um, and, and this held true for other types of programs like their substance use treatment programs and education programs. So people who are mismatched for services don't do as well as people who are appropriate for services. And the harder challenge in many organizations is to really think about how do we actually assign people to what types of treatment programs. So again, kind of refreshing, we already went through the risk needs, the stabilizers, and lifestyle issues. Um, and this becomes very complicating decision trees that one has to do. Um, so uh, many of you, as part of your CSAC grants, may be asked to use the r, &R simulation tool. Um, if not, uh, you're more than welcome to go on our website and play around with it. Um, but essentially, that tool is designed to really help match people to appropriate services. Um, and what that tool does is to take your standard assessment information that your agency uses and use that information to assign people to an appropriate level of care. Um, so, you know, and it produces something like this that basically says that, it, you know, for this particular person, their likely recidivism rate is 40%, but if you put them in a better best fit program for that, we can really drive that down to 33%. Now that may not look like a drastic change to you, but that is, you know, a, a, you know, for the challenges that many people re, uh, meet, that is a good reduction, um, particularly when we're talking about within a year. Um, but the tool basically does these best fits and second best fits by thinking about different needs of the client and trying to match them to characteristics of the programs. Um, within, um, and a big part of this tool is that you have information um, to talk with the client about their risk level, what their likely recidivism is, and why they need to be invested more so in different programs and services. Um, <clears throat> what's also very useful is this is visual, and so it helps people really see what the benefits are to themselves. Embedded in this, um, you know, treatment matching is um, an underlying scheme of different types of programs and services focused in on what we know within the uh, field about effective programs and their impact on different types of outcomes for clients if the person has those particular needs. Um, so this was uh, developed actually through a consensus panel, um, and it's based upon theories of how programs can help change individuals. Obviously, it builds upon the evidence-based programming that I um, started out my presentation with about uh, 20 minutes ago. Um, and what's nice is, is that we built uh, the ability for you to actually go in and see how well your program does in matching the principles of evidence-based treatments or services based upon what your services actually are. And it creates a report card um, where you could see for your particular type of program how well you're doing on these different domains that we talked about, risk, needs, responsivity. Also, in terms of implementing these core concepts, providing dosage, and then um, providing an overall score. And also within each of these bars, we give you a little cheat sheet so you know if you want to make some improvements, what are areas you can make improvements. Um, and this particular toolkit we've used in a number of different places. This is kind of an example of 19 different programs in one particular jurisdiction. You can see there's a lot of variation in terms of the scores on any particular area um, and what the average score is. Um, and um, we've actually added some new scores here having to do with other types of implementation issues. Um, and then to put all of this together, um, we also developed a methodology so that you could look at 
you know, whether or not the programs and services that your program offers or your jurisdiction offers meets up with the needs of the clientele in your jurisdiction. Um, so essentially, in the R&R &R simulation tool, we allow you to look at the individual, we allow you to look at the um, program, and we allow you to look at either your jurisdiction or the unit that you're working in to see how well you're meeting the needs of your population. So with that, I just want to kind of close up and say, you know, we're really, the r, r model was designed to help us better think about who should go into what type of program. Um, it's a complicated question because people are complicated. Um, and I'll now going to turn over the presentation um, to my colleague, uh, Deborah, um, so she can really show how she's put this in place um, within her practice. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here um, participating in this um, in this webinar. And I'm going to start where Faye left off in talking about taking the next steps, a model for integrated uh, recidivism reduction and treatment planning for individuals with co-occurring disorders. And where I am coming from is from the role of both a practitioner, a psychiatrist on the ground, as well as somebody who's worked um, within the correctional system and um, at a policy level. And where I spend a lot of my time is helping to get um, some collaborative conversation between justice, the justice professionals and treating professionals, um, because oftentimes we're working in silos and we don't speak the same language. For example, this R and R language is something that really has been unfamiliar to most behavioral health um, systems, even though it is something that is more familiar where you have correctional supervision or in the in the community or even within uh, within correctional institutions. So I'm going to start by taking us through a case so we can think a little bit more about how it applies to an actual case, and I'm going to. Uh, provide an example of a model that we've developed um, through a variety of SAMHSA grants and um, Bureau of Justice Assistance grants and, and other funding sources to really look at how the service models can bring the uh, provider community and the correctional community together in a more collaborative manner to achieve the same goals. And the way I look at these things from a person-centered perspective are that recidivism reduction is a recovery oriented goal. Because the more we can have people establish themselves in the community and sustain positive community tenure, the better they will be able to uh, work, even if they have chronic illness that they need to manage, um, the better they will be able to function, have meaningful relationships, um, jobs, stability, the things that we all seek in life. So I'm gonna start with the story of Jack. Now, Jack is a, an amalgamation of probably somebody that you may all be familiar with, um, but we describe him here as a 24-year-old male with repetitive domestic violence and robbery charges and a history of 10 prior arrests. He's been using substances since the age of 12 when he started with alcohol, and this gets into exactly what Faye was talking about before, as you see somebody who has a very early onset of a substance use disorder that's gonna require perhaps a, a, a sophisticated understanding or at least some understanding of, of what it means to begin using substances at age 12 and what that means for risk um, and where that could impact uh, development. Now he served a two year sentence on his latest armed robbery charge related to trying to get money to support what, has, what he now has as a heroin habit. His mother died recently and his father is not in the picture. So he's facing loss and trauma, um, disruption in, in his community life by serving this two-year sentence. He had a poor adjustment to his incarceration with several initial disciplinary issues. Um, his peer influences were strong, and then he, quote unquote, settled into the correctional environment and essentially now is re-entering into the community after serving this sentence. 
Now he's gonna be referred as part of a reentry plan, perhaps to a community provider to help support him and, and, and support his mental health, medical needs and substance use needs. So how does R&R fit into treatment of this individual? So what I'm gonna be uh, highlighting is a model that we developed, my colleague, Dr. David Smelson, originally developed this mission model, um, first looking at a uh, homeless uh, group of veterans. Um, and we have adapted some of the principles in that model to a criminal justice framework, incorporating some of the R&R principles into a treatment manual um, that also uh, is accompanied by a participant workbook. As this model has been developed, we've also, uh, added on fidelity measures that track whether the person is, well, how much uh, services the person is actually getting in the community that goes back to some of the dosing issues that uh, Faye was mentioning. And um, our teams with, uh, when we do some, when we have implemented these programs, provide a lot of consultation to the, the treatment teams on the ground and, the, and their clinical supervisors, as well as to probation and parole to try and ensure the fidelity to the model. Essentially what the mission criminal justice model is, is a combination of multiple evidence-based services into a comprehensive system of care, combined with the person in the middle. It, it, could, it is comprised of core services, including something called critical time intervention, which um, takes the premise that when people are transitioning or at complex periods of time, uh, in, in their trajectory that they may need more intensive services up front and more intensive supports. And as they gain some stability and some more solid footing uh, in treatment as usual, then the intensity can be reduced and they can be uh, transitioned over to usual uh, care providers. It also encompasses dual recovery therapy, which is a cognitive behavioral therapy approach to treating people with co-occurring mental health and substance use conditions simultaneously. As we all know, oftentimes substance use and mental health are looked at as separate issues. And yet, as we're trying to look at the person as a whole, it's important to think about what their challenges are as they're trying to uh, find their way if they're dealing with some type of substance use issue, as well as perhaps some mental health issue, anything ranging from anxiety, trauma-related issues, depression, to even more serious mental illness. And then another element in the Mission CJ model, another core service, is peer support. And peer support provides an opportunity for individuals to engage with other individuals who have had similar experiences and can provide a solid framework of uh, positive role modeling and perhaps provide an offer of hope that there can be an opportunity for uh, recovery. In addition, the Mission CJ model encompasses this idea that support services are necessary to help the individual um, with more than just their mental health or substance use needs. And those support services include vocational and educational supports. We also have family supports, as well as this idea that whatever we do has to take into account a trauma lens, because we know from lots of literature that individuals involved in the justice system, especially those with mental health and uh, substance use needs, are going to have, there's going to be a high prevalence of trauma histories, whether it's early developmental exposure through adverse childhood events prior to the age of 18, or even trauma that they've had as adults uh, in, and even, uh, even trauma that they've been exposed to as adults past the age of 18. So whatever we do has to incorporate the notion that we're working with individuals who may have challenges forming attachments, um, they may have issues uh, related to uh, finding their way in the world from, based on some of their trauma experiences. The Mission CJ model um, is one that really takes the principles, as I've outlined before, and combines a team of a, this peer support specialist and a case manager specialist who offer these evidence-based practices and use their supporting framework to help connect the individual being served into um, various service, services that they may need. So for example, the case manager and the peer will work with the client 
and identify a variety of needs utilizing something similar to what Faye was saying in terms of this public health approach. For example, the individual may have housing needs. The individual may have the need for benefits to be reinstated since they're emerging, like our uh, case example with Jack, they're emerging from a correctional environment. And even in those communities where, uh, for example, Medicaid may be suspended and not terminated, there still may be a need to ensure that the benefits are aligned so that the services can actually be received shortly after their release. And there might need to be some bridging, uh, some bridging activities to ensure that um, services are available to them while benefits are uh, getting renegotiated. The individual may need mental health services. They may need trauma-specific therapies. And they may need substance use treatment. I think it's really important to, to uh, recognize what Faye said so eloquently, which is that we understand substance use is a major driver of what brings people back into the criminal justice system. But at the same time, criminal justice professionals often use substance use as a reason for uh, having someone return into the criminal justice system. And so where the treatment system looks at substance use disorders, perhaps from a harm reduction model, and we understand that relapse may be part of the journey for someone facing, for someone who's struggling with a, with a chronic illness, like for example, an opioid use disorder or an alcohol use disorder as Jack has, when they are showing positive signs of relapse, the criminal justice system may find that as a reason for non-adherence to the terms of probation or supervision, and may find that as a reason to pull them back into a correctional setting. And so there's a bit of a chicken and an egg going on in terms of where, how substance use plays a role in criminal recidivism. And we aren't always speaking the same language or on the same page with, our, with between public safety and human services in terms of what types of substance, how is substance use disorder being treated and how is risk of relapse um, being addressed? And so aligning, um, having this, uh, the case manager and the peer look at the substance use issues for the individual and understand what their needs are and what level of substance use treatment needs they have is gonna be a very important function. At the same time, the case management, um, the case manager and the peer work closely with the criminal justice professionals. So for example, in Jack's situation, if he's going to be on probation or parole, the case manager and the peer would be in communication with the supervising entity so that there can be a plan in place to both protect public safety, but also promote Jack's recovery. Furthermore, working on linkages to general medical care and uh, educational and vocational supports are all part of the mission linkage support uh, model. The major goals in this activity are going to be improving clinical outcomes and functioning, and again, maximizing community tenure, which means reducing the risk of rearrest, reducing the risk of serious criminal activity, trying to prevent incarceration, and trying to reduce mental health and substance use sim symptoms so that people can primarily receive the, the level of care that would be most appropriate and ideally an outpatient level of care unless their symptoms reemerge and they need a more intensive level of care for a period of time. The other uh, uh, key goals would be to identify and link individuals to these comprehensive and effective community-based behavioral health care in a way that will help sus them sustain themselves in treatment once the case management and peer service um, moves away to another uh, client because these are time limited services in a, in a linkage model that lasts anywhere from two months, four months, six months, or one year, depending on the program model. In addition, a key goal is to prevent homelessness and to work on those housing connections. And again, all while enhancing, not compromising public safety. This has been implemented at the Justice Interface in several different programs, uh, including wrapping this model around services provided for specialty treatment court dockets, in jail reentry, in prison reentry, and then in veteran-specific uh, justice services, just to name a few. The other uh, aspect of the model, which I think even if you're not using this particular model, you can take home as some potential uh, follow-ups from this webinar, is 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 uh, in line with what um, 
Faye is describing in terms of developing a treatment plan. We have developed what we call the R&R Treatment Support Tool, and we utilize this treatment support tool to identify the standard criminogenic risks that are usually in many of these risk assessment tools. But then we really work on, uh, on identifying goals, um, goals for the individual and for the team. Included in our R&R treatment support tool, we have uh, um, modules that have the case manager and the peer work on, for example, a chart to look at who are the peers in this person's life and how many of them are stabilizing peers and how many of them are destabilizing peers. Similarly, we have them look at family relationships and where there are um, issues that might need to be sorted out. In Jack's case, for example, he was arrested on domestic violence charges, and so we're going to need the case manager and the peer and the treatment services are going to need to understand what's going on in those relationships where domestic violence is an issue. The other thing that we do and spend time on is comes from models that have been promoted by, by, by a variety of professionals, including um, those, uh, um, Prince and Osher and the Council of State Governments, who talks about this idea of understanding your roles and where people, understanding various roles in terms of the needs of the individual with regard to their behavioral health needs, as well as their criminogenic um, risks and needs, and then using a model of collaboration with the criminal justice system between the behavioral health and criminal justice system that prioritizes populations in a way that will help them the most. This is similar to phase goodness of fit um, conversation of getting the programs to fit the, the programs that fit the person's needs the most. This is about getting the partners to meet the needs of the individual most. So that if you have an individual who's at, who's at high criminogenic risk and also has high treatment service needs, that's going to require a lot of collaboration and conversation between the supervising entity and the treatment professional. Whereas if you have somebody who has lower needs, there may not need to be quite as tight a collaboration. And in fact, if there's over monitoring or over supervision, it could potentially put somebody at greater risk for recidivism because of the over monitoring that's involved. Now to engage oneself in this collaborative model, first of all, um, one has to be comfortable reaching across the aisle. And then one has to understand that there are different roles that each particular entity plays. And there should be some clarity and discussion as you start to work together about how, how roles might differ and how you can best utilize the roles for the benefit of the client and, again, for the benefit of, of the public in terms of public safety. So, for example, looking at the primary goal, in treatment we think about symptom reduction and alleviation of suffering. And although correctional super, supervisors wouldn't want people to suffer and wouldn't want symptoms, their primary targeted goal is public safety and reducing criminal recidivism. And you can go down this list and look at how um, techniques are utilized, for example, engagement strategies versus legally mandated oversight, um, uh, working on uh, knowing the system and linking them to services might be something that's similar but should be coordinated so people aren't working at cross purposes when you have a parole officer and a and a case manager working to help the individual similarly, and then developing uh, protocols about information sharing, how does one respond to court orders, um, what, how does one think about privacy, and, and issues like that where if the collaboration is done well, some of these issues can be work, sorted out to benefit uh, the end goal um, of the work being done. So then you move from theory to practice in developing these kind of strategies. It's a person-centered approach to risk mitigation, so that rather than just utilize the framework of a label of somebody being high, medium, or low risk, it really involves the treatment planning and talking uh, uh, both to the client to understand what their goals are, understand where their strengths, their resiliency factors are, as well as their needs, understand how they got to where they're at, trying to join the client or the patient wherever they are and help motivate them for positive change and hold hope for the individual's potential, identifying both small steps and big steps. And it's all about helping work with the person around goal setting for now and for their future 
and barriers, both systemic barriers and individual barriers that uh, get in the way of goal attainment. So for example, here we have Jack and his treatment plan that we've worked out using the treatment support plan. Now we know we identify with what we call resiliency factors, the positive factors, not just working on what are his problems, but what are some things that we can um, capitalize on with in supporting his recovery. For example, he's attending programming and even though he had a hard adjustment to incarceration, his behavior is less volatile. So we wanna use techniques like the promising practice of motivational interviewing to help, mo to help move his motivation and rationale to move him out of this cycle that he's been in. In terms of uh, another approach, it might be to identify positive peer models and use the peer specialist to connect him to other positive peer influences. Similarly, if we look at some of his, tr the traditional criminogenic risks that were rated high, like his antisocial, cognitions, behaviors, and attitudes, we can look at targeted goals for intervention that are really measurable. So for example, if we want him to reduce these antisocial acts involved in this domestic violence cycle that he's in, we wanna both have the, the supervising entity understand what they're doing with monitoring, but also encouraging and providing education, as well as helping Jack work with his substance use work with the issues that have arisen from his long-standing use of heroin um, and alcohol, understand what's happening with the losses in his life and his own prior history of trauma, as well as helping him to focus on what he can do in a positive way. For example, a measurable goal for him might be have him attend at least one pro-social activity with a peer within two weeks of the treatment team meeting. And you can see we work through each of these issues for example, family relations to understand what, what he might need. If depression is part of his picture, we wanna work on treating that depression. And then returning to his substance use, we wanna maximize his substance use treatment, identifying through uh, ASAM level of care, what would be the most appropriate way to address his alcohol use and his heroin use um, to get him into medication assisted therapies that can benefit him in the long run. And so this is just an example of how you as treatment providers can reach across and, and as justice professionals can reach across your aisle to work with individuals who largely have co-occurring disorders, but who also have complex needs in um, uh, criminogenic features that present as complex needs and potentially improve their outcomes through a collaborative strategy. The focus is because the problems emerge and the systems are so complex, the focus must integrate these different approaches and continue to refine them as you go forward with lessons learned and the person at the center of the plan without compromising public safety. There's going to be challenges, of course. Staff training needs to be ongoing. Many justice professionals don't, aren't heavily embedded in the behavioral health system and so might not understand it, whereas Similarly, people in the behavioral health system might not understand the goings on of the justice system. And so cross trainings and staff trainings need to be ongoing. And these cross system challenges, um, which, are, which can be unique, need to be tackled to help uh, ensure success and maximize uh, those successes despite the challenges. So I think with that, I will um, stop. Uh, and I believe we have time for questions. Thank you so much. So we uh, now do have time for questions. And um, as you can see on the right side of your screen, there is a Q&A portal. So we won't be able to, to have people uh, speak their questions, but please type them in. And I'm uh, happy to read them out to our uh, presenters uh, so that we can get those questions answered. At the same time, uh, we are opening up our last poll for the day, and you'll see that underneath the Q&A portal. Uh, we are just interested in hearing if there are certain areas where you would like to see more information in terms of applying R&R. &R. Uh, so please respond if you would like, and also um, please enter in any questions. Uh, we have a few that have popped up. So I'm just gonna go through and start to read those out to our presenters. Uh, 
Sophie commented, um, and I, I believe that she said this during Faye's presentation, but I would love to hear from both of you regarding this. Um, will you say more about why people are moving away from the term criminogenic to describe dynamic risk factors? I've never liked the term, but I get a lot of pushback from corrections agencies when I, when I encourage them not to use the term. Uh, well, so this is Faye. So I, I really, um, I think within the last five to six years, there has been, a, you know, a growing awareness that the language that we have used in the field of corrections and criminal justice um, in, in many ways is both stigmatizing to the individual, um, belittling of the individual, and actually, um, you know, from a more clinical perspective, um, makes it more difficult to build trust and communicate with the individual. And the term criminal, <laughs> the term criminogenic, um, I, I sort of like to laugh about that term because that term really came out of Canada um, in the early 90s when there was a, a focus of attention of just trying to basically draw attention by uh, two psychologists that, you know, there are certain behaviors that um, are more related to criminal behavior and that we should be focusing our attention on that. And so they coined this term criminogenic. But if you actually look at some components of the R&R &R model, particularly the need models, um, it's not like people within the criminal justice system have all of those attributes. That's why I was trying to draw my presentation just this whole issue about criminal thinking. You know, in the uh, corrections, we talk a lot about criminal thinking. Um, and, you know, we, my team started really kind of exploring this um, a, a while back to begin to say, well, what does this really mean? Because in many ways, cr criminal thinking, a lot of the definitions they have about justifying and rationalizing behavior, you know, that's typical human conditions and defense mechanisms that people use. So, <laughs> um, so, so I believe corrections, because, you know, as a means of trying to um, basically have a discipline has wedded to these terms. And, and I think over time there will be more and more recognition that using terms that are basically, you know, separate individuals and are deme demeaning to individuals will not serve the greater purpose of trying to really help people change. Um, and I think if you're having conversations with your corrections people, having them talk about, you know, are we interested in helping people change? Well, you know, if I'm interested, if I'm interested in losing weight, I don't want someone calling me, you know, obese or fat. I want them um, to, you know, treat me as an individual. And so how we use our language as a way of trying to help people you know, begin to think about, okay, the goal here is to really support the person. And I think in the field of corrections, that's, you know, evolving. Um, but I, I think, you know, as Deborah said, there is a need to have these discussions about language that we use. And that is, to me, one area. Deb, any, uh, do you want to add to that comment? Yeah, no, I would agree with what they said. I mean, in the, you know, in the behavioral health world, it would, you know, it is stigmatizing. It makes, it, it's a stigmatizing term. And frankly, it's a confusing term. I think most people, when you ask them the definition, will give you some different definitions because it is confusing. So I think what they said is absolutely accurate. Um, I, I will say, too, that one of the things we don't often think about with criminal thinking, and this is not as an apologist standpoint, um, but criminal thinking sometimes is also adaptive thinking given the environments that people have been in. So we really have to understand even that the, the idea of criminal thinking is, is what is the goal of these types of cognates, these kind of cognitions in, in this environment and are they 
going to help this person or harm this person or others. And so even those constructs, I think, we're learning more about. Okay. We've got several more questions. Um, it looks like a couple of questions came up about the specific tool or model that both of you mentioned. So if you could just briefly reshare with the, the audience the specific tool or model that you uh, covered in your presentation and also clarify if you think that those are appropriate to use with juvenile populations. Uh, well, so um, the tool I was referring to is called the Risk Needs Responsivity Tool. Uh, I'm sorry, the Risk Needs Responsivity Simulation Tool, r and &R Simulation Tool. Um, and you can go to the website of my organization and, um, you, you know, um, get access to it um, if, just to doodle around with it. Um, so the program tool is applicable um, to uh, juvenile populations, juvenile programs. The individual level one is not um, because the way those algorithms that uh, underscore that, they were based off of adult data systems. So I would not use those. Um, but, you know, if anyone's interested, we could discuss with them sort of, you know, some modifications. We, we just recently finished some work um, in St. Louis, Missouri with United Way in which we use a modified version to really help look at um, juvenile justice um, and child welfare needs um, using similar domains. Uh, but uh, the program tool is um, the jurisdictional gap analysis is, but the individual level one is not. And then the one, this is um, um, Deborah speaking, the, the, the one that I was describing, um, people can look at the information about the model at missionmodel.org. Um, the r and &R treatment plan support tool is not, has not been used on a juvenile population. Um, but, and the tool itself is really um, taking a treatment planning principle that we do very traditionally in substance use treatment and in mental health treatment, and then the planning instruments that correctional, super, correctional entities utilize with the r and &R and bringing them together. So even if one is not using this specific support tool, I mean, it is kind of folded out, you know, rolled out for people, but if one just brings together the provider community and the justice uh, professionals that you're working with, like, for example, if you're working in, at the interface of a treatment court or in a reentry service model, um, you know, it really, getting each side to talk about what it is that they're doing in terms of treatment planning um, can really be helpful in fostering that dialogue of what are we looking for, what are our outcomes that we're trying to see, um, achieve with this individual and then bringing those instruments together. But the, the one we utilize can be found at missionmodel.org. Okay, great. Uh, we, we had a question come up. Fred asked, um, how does the r, r framework relate to the ASAM criteria in re regards to treatment planning? So I can jump in on that. Um, this. Um, it has not, I mean, the ASAM criteria came out after R&R came out. The ASAM criteria focus on the level of care needed for people with um, a variety of, you know, with, you know, substance use disorder, which, of course, occurs on a continuum. Um, and, you know, funding structures for substance use services are increasingly looking at ASAM criteria leveling to make sure that you have a goodness of fit. One of the things we see, for example, uh, very often is somebody might have a housing need, and so even though their substance use disorder is well managed and could benefit from outpatient treatment, because they have a housing need, they often get put in residential substance abuse treatment. And so that's, that's uh, an issue, and that's also an issue when, uh, for example, a correctional official thinks that the residential placement is going to best address the substance use need, 
But if the substance use need isn't what's really being addressed because it's not needed in that environment, then they're not really going to get what they thought they were going to get out of that. And so um, they, they have not yet aligned, and that's probably another direction that's going to be happening as we look at substance use disorder and real need, the real needs that people have for their substance use disorder treatment. I don't know, Faye, if you have other things to say. Faye, would you like to add anything to that? All right, I, I, hearing none, we'll move to the next question. Um, Deb, this was asked specifically of the, um, the your model that you presented, but Faye, um, I welcome you to jump in as well to describe, um, you know, how does the model uh, work with veteran-specific justice services? Is there anything you could elaborate on that, Deb? Yeah, so again, we started working on this model in a, um, using this as a alternative to incarceration model for people that were um, attached to probation, they pled guilty. Um, we started this in, uh, in pilot sites in Massachusetts, um, and we went to three different pilot sites. And so we got a lot of experience working with veterans. One thing we would add in that circle where you have the case manager and the peer working with the client is obviously if they're a veteran, you want to get the VA services. So you're going to have that as another activity that the case manager and peer do. Also within the VA, there's its own initiatives related to justice involved veterans. Um, the VJO system, for example, uh, has become quite robust across the country and um, they will provide linkage for people as well to VA treatment as usual services. One of the challenges we see with veterans involved in the justice system is that some of them may or may not choose to get their treatment in the VA, or some of them may or may not have the entitlement to, you know, for VA benefits. It may be that some of their behavioral health conditions started while they were in the military. So one of the things we have also had our case managers and peers do as they work with veterans is really look at the, um, the um, qualifications and whether there's any appeal that needs to be put in place about whether a particular individual who has a history of military service should be re, um, re, re reviewed for whether they could qualify for VA benefits, um, given the complexity of how behavioral health symptoms sometimes emerge or, or exhibit themselves while somebody's serving in the military. So there's, there's several different aspects to the to the services that one could provide that would um, put some additional resources and emphasis on, on veterans. We've also looked at veterans um, in the model in terms of um, how to work with them, how to understand their trauma histories, military and pre-military trauma histories, and how that might get incorporated into some of their uh, responses um, to, um, you know, in some of their behaviors, um, for example, irritability, um, aggression might be related to some PTSD symptoms that they've been having and so ensuring that they're getting proper evaluation and treatment because that can again help in terms of looking at recidivism risk and recidivism reduction. We, we want to make sure we, we, like with all people, get them the appropriate clinical assessment to ensure that we're addressing whatever the clinical needs are. Faye, do you have anything you want to add to that? I believe we may have lost her, that connection, so um, uh, we will follow up with her after. Um, Deb, I have a couple more questions um, to go over. A couple of questions have come up around um, substance use disorders and the use of r and uh, so I'm going to try to kind of blend those questions. Um, it looks like people are interested in knowing more about some of the research um, behind using r and uh, to in the treatment of substance use disorders um, and uh, if there are any uh, risk and needs tools specifically that would be appropriate for people um, in a court focused on driving under the influence. 
So is there, is there more information you could share around the use of the r and model and any other, uh, you know, risk assessment tools or those kind of things specifically for people who need um, substance use treatment? So um, that's a, the way that question is worded is quite complex. Um, so remember with the r and literature, the original literature talked about the eight criminogenic risks that the eight risk factors that were most correlated with criminal recidivism. Um, four had to do with antisocial behavior patterns, cognition, and we had family, and family uh, relationships, um, um, leisure, recreational leisure time, et cetera, and then substance use was, was uh, the, is the eighth identified um, factor related to criminal recidivism. So, um, but it's a general term in the r and literature. Substance use is a general term. Um, it doesn't necessarily fully look at the degree and severity of substance use disorder as it's evolved in our clinical thinking, for example, as DSM-5 has evolved. Um, and so what we would suggest is that there be a careful assessment um, even if somebody does a, a risk assessment uh, tool like an um, like a compass or an an ORS um, uh, type of instrument or an LSI based instrument, you know, to get at the risk, you're still going to want to have an assessment or a screening of substance use needs, and then an assessment of what level of care the person might need for their substance use. Because somebody, I mean, this is where it gets a little bit, you know, chicken and egg. Because, for example, driving under the influence, somebody could be repeatedly driving under the influence and repeatedly arrested. Well, until you treat that, um, that alcohol use disorder, you're not going to reduce the recidivism. They may have no antisocial background or behaviors. That may not be part of the picture, but it's really getting them into the proper substance use treatment if you want to get that issue addressed. So I, I think it really requires that collaborative effort that, um, the, you know, sobriety courts, for example, and, and other kind of drug courts really need to pull in the treatment providers to understand what is the treatment that this person really needs for their substance use disorder. Uh, Hi. That we have feedback on you. the line. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. So I'm sorry, I, I don't know what happened. I was, I couldn't, I, I've been on the line, but um, the phone thing didn't work. Um, anyway, I just wanted to add to what Deb said. So um, essentially all of the criminal justice instruments um, that are referred to COMPASS, ORS, LSIR, I mean the whole strong R, none of them have a good substance use mental health um, screener in them at all. And so I always um, recommend that people, you know, essentially do not use those uh, subscales in those tools if you're interested in alcohol substance use disorders or mental health issues. Um, it's unfortunate that the uh, instrument designers have not um, modified that. Um, you modified the tools by now, but really we have to look outside of those tools. And there are a number of good instruments that are public domain, the ASI, the TCU drug screen um, that are available. And I would use those more so because as Deb suggested, you really need a severity measure. We need to understand to what degree is people's drug or alcohol use affecting their functioning, um, and then that should drive the treatment planning. All right. Um, there are, uh, let's see, a couple of questions um, about, and I'm just reading through to, to see what might be a priority. Um, TJ asks, could you speak more on the negative impacts of over-programming or programming that does not meet needs? Do you want to take that, Faye, or you want me to? Um, I'll, I can start and you can add. Um, 
so essentially there's two issues. There's over-programming and there's um, using the wrong programs. Um, so essentially, you know, what is most important is making sure that the client first understands what their needs are and understands why a particular program might be Say, I believe you lost audio. I can jump in and just pick up where she left off while she's getting her audio. If you can hear me, Melissa? Yes, thank you, Deb. Yep, no, I think she's probably saying what I would say is that getting the client to both understand and help figure out and from their own perspective with the guidance of, you know, the professionals, um, to figure out what program will be the correct program and then, you know, not over-programming. The problem with over-programming is that sometimes people have um, challenges. I mean, we all have challenges. Let's face it, every single day we all have little challenges that might come up. The problem with over-programming is that if you over-monitor, then for, for, for Lips or relapses or, um, you know, an argument with, with, with someone that's not a, 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 a violent outburst might get looked at with the lens of this person being under the criminal justice system and, being, and, then, and then having them potentially, for example, violated or brought back into jail while there's a hearing to look at why they had a relapse on their substance use. Now, that is a really difficult line to walk because of course we want to we want public safety we all want public safety and so that's where some of this work on figuring out how much supervision is is going to be the right amount of supervision for the risk this person presents um, what is it that we're trying to prevent we're trying to prevent real harm from happening um, so working out some protocols between probation and the treatment provider together can be one way of minimizing the risk of, of over-programming. The other thing with over-programming is if they're over-programmed, so for example, I, had, I was working one time with a, a drug court and the judge wanted the person to be in a 90-day residential program and the person left the 90-day program at, at day 75. Now normally you'd say, well, that's not right because you're supposed to be there for 90 days. But it turned out this man had gone back, had gotten full employment, he had re, reunited with a positive influence in his family, and he was continuing to engage in medication-assisted therapy as a in a community outpatient program, and by ASAM level of care, he didn't really need residential program. So in that case, keeping him in an over-program residential care setting would have potentially left him without employment because he wouldn't have been able to keep his job. Um, it would have left him perhaps without the ability to reunite with the family. And so you see that, again, you want to look at the total picture and not be overly overly formulaic in the considerations, even though I know with, you know, drug courts, obviously they, do, they are far more structured than, than some, you know, than mental health courts in terms of phases and things like that, um, depending on how they're delivered. But you still want to look at the whole person and make sure that the programming is the right programming and that the programming level doesn't overly monitor and put the person at greater risk of recidivism when the mutual goal is to reduce recidivism from both the public health standpoint and the correctional standpoint. It's a lot easier Thank said you. than done. And Faye, have you, have you been able to get back on yet? I hope so. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> I have no idea what's going on here. But um, yeah, so just one quick um, mention this is a tricky issue because we seem to want to think that everybody needs programs um, and uh, you know we need to basically begin to start understanding that you know for some people if they can keep it get a have a job keep a job you know uh, and you know maintain other parts of life functioning the 
you know, in recovery and managing the recovery, then maybe a program isn't where they need to be. Um, and so our efforts are always thinking about what program and services do we need to put people in. And I really think, you know, again, going, you know, filled in nicely where I was going, which is begin with the client. Um, sometimes just helping people select things that they really care about, parenting issues, you know, um, helping, um, you know, be part of an you know a, a group or uh, are good segues to really help people integrate. And if they don't need services, you know why should we push them into services? Um, we have enough people who need services who can't get into services. In terms of research, there's increasing amount of research about you know both placing people in the wrong programs, but also over-programming. And essentially, most of the over-programming just shows that people, you know, um, tend to have violation problems. They resent going to services they're not, that aren't needed. It interferes with life functioning, and that causes other sort of issues. Um, so I think this is one area where, you know, as we begin to really talk more with our clients and really, you know, listen to what some of their needs are, I think we could benefit greatly. Yeah, and one other thing I just want to say is what we notice in all of our programs where we have additional support, the times of transition, no matter what, whether they're coming out of a drug court, a mental health court, a reentry, you know, they're reentering from an incarceration or a detention, and then even when we're providing them wraparound services while they're getting connected to, to whatever treatment is usual or whatever, these times of transition are very complex. And um, what you want is to help people get into some kind of support that will be sustainable over time that they will like. So because if they're only going because they're mandated to go, um, when that mandate ends, the chances of them sticking with it are much less. And so, um, the chance then of relapse and return is much greater. So it's really behooves us all to think from the very beginning about how do we meet the needs of all of these factors. And again, it's much easier said than done, but that's an important, these are important conversations to be having at the get-go when we're starting to work with people and work with partnerships in the systems. All right, thank you. Um, we are coming to the end of this webinar, so we will not be able to answer all of the questions that were submitted. Um, however, there will be two opportunities for seeing more information. We will um, reach out to our presenters to see if we can get responses to these questions. We also are planning a second webinar on R&R to take place in the next calendar year, so please watch for that. And, um, you know, it's likely that some of your questions will be answered in the next webinar. Um, just briefly want to mention there are a couple of open solicitations at the GAIN Center. Um, if your jurisdiction is interested in technical assistance, uh, first of all, we are offering uh, sequential intercept mapping workshops, and these will be funded through GAIN's funds. Um, and these workshops we're hoping to focus on jurisdictions that want to improve and expand diversion opportunities at Intercept 2, which is the jail uh, intake process, and Intercept 3, which is jail and uh, court processes. So um, anyone interested in um, applying to uh, see if you can uh, win a sequential intercept mapping workshop, uh, please reach out for more information. And we also have opportunities for jurisdictions to receive a train the trainer workshop around um, how being informed, trauma-informed improves criminal justice system responses. And so uh, both of these solicitations will end on December 21st, so please do submit your application if you're interested in those. And next slide. We also, through the SOAR TA Center, um, there's an opportunity for jurisdictions that want to expand their capacity uh, to help people obtain benefits through criminal justice programs. And uh, at that link, you can find more information. Um, again, that opportunity, the, the solicitation will close December 21st, so please do get those applications in if you are interested in being considered um, for SOAR technical assistance. 
The last thing is, uh, you know, we uh, appreciate your responses to the poll. And again, as we um, develop our follow-up webinar, we'll be using this information to shape that. And I uh, just want to say thank you so much to Dr. Pinels and Dr. Paxman for their time and all of this wonderful, rich information that you brought to the field today. We really appreciate it. Happy to and be with here. that, with that, we're at the end of our webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to having you all join us at the next at the next.